First up today is Danielle Appstone. She runs Other Machine Company. She's the, uh, uh, sorry, Other Machine Company. Yes, that's right. Yes. Uh, CEO. Uh, degree from MIT in chemical engineering and uh, went to DARPA, worked on that, and that actually was what became the Other Mill, the Other Machine Company, Other Mill. If you haven't tried the Other Mill, I don't think we have any here, but you'll see a video, and they're great, great pieces of equipment really making board milling much more accessible. So please welcome to the stage, Daniel Applestone. Oh yeah, let's go back. Great. All right. Okay, thank you all. Thanks so much for uh, inviting me to be here. Um, the title of this talk, The Quest for the Highest Precision Per Dollar, I wish I knew that's what we were doing when we first started starting this company. Um, and it really, it's, it's so important to know what it is you're building and who it's for. And so this talk is about uh, thinking about that before you get started. Um, it's kind of why I'm talking here and why I'm not talking at like the Craft and Hobby Association, because uh, that's not actually who needs CNC machines, I found out. Uh, so what I do is I'm a CEO of the company. I used to be a scientist, but I decided that uh, accessibility to CNC machines was more important than that. So this was me yesterday, just milling a bunch of, board. I made presents for people uh, while I was procrastinating on the talk. This is a board mill. It does a lot of other things, but I was really trying to see what kind of performance I could get out of this thing. So I make uh, on a five by four, PCB, you can make 40 of these little breakout boards. Uh, it takes less than two minutes to make each one, and that's kind of the point. Now I know what we're doing is there's a lot of people out there who want to be able to make boards faster than they can get them back from China. So that's what I do. Uh, caveats, this is just my experience. I'm actually a scientist. I have no formal business training, um, but that doesn't stop you from trying. Uh, so we have about 16 people. We sell this other mill. It's like two to three thousand dollars. We build uh, them in the mission over about a mile and a half from here. And so anything that you see, just kind of take it with a grain of salt, knowing that there's probably other people who know more than me. But given that, there are three things that I think are the most important things I wish I'd known before I started this company, which is who actually wants your hardware, how many people are there that fit that description, and what really matters most to them. Because if you spend all of your time making something that's portable, and the people you're selling it to don't care if it's portable, uh, then you have a problem there. And we, we, uh, we spent a lot of time and money um, thinking and working on things that, that didn't actually matter, but now we know what does. Uh, the other thing is the way you manufacture really matters how many of these things are you going to need to be building in your third year of production? Uh, it's not really right now that matters. It's not when you're huge. It's really the year three, which is the sweet spot, um, which we found out. And the other thing is data is so important. We started collecting data before we even know what we were going to do with it, and it turns out that a lot has allowed us to do a lot with not, that very, not very many people. So, who wants what you build is really important to ask, and this is an iterative process for us. So who, who is it? What's their persona? What matters most to them? And then can you support them? Uh, and the, the example is, in, even if you go to our website, you'll find it's, it's kind of generic. You don't really know what this product is for. Um, and that has a lot to do with thinking about, you know, there was, you build something for everyone, and it's kind of like not the right tool for anyone, because it's very generic. Um, so thinking about who these people are, picking out the things that matter most to them and are going to ch change their life in some way, and then thinking about can you support them. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things I think about now is, um, you know, if we're going through this exercise and we're saying, okay, let's, what about jewelers? So 
jewelers, they want to make physical objects. They want them to be highly customized. That's all great. They care about being able to incorporate gems. They care about being able to do rings. We don't really do rings that well. Can we support them? Well, most of them don't know CAD. So the support requirements for someone who wants to, know, wants to make their own jewelry, while we love the idea that someone would be able to make their own jewelry, there's no way we could possibly train up this, this group of people uh, on how to use our machine yet. Maybe someday, hopefully. Um, so what we decided was actually the people who really love the thing that we build are electrical engineers, electrical engineering faculty and students. Uh, there's different buyers and different users, like the person buying it is often the person not the person using it. Um, but what they're doing right now is they don't fabricate PCBs, they use chemical etching or they use external board fab. And, um, and so we're like, well, these are the people who really love the thing that we do. So let's make it really amazing for them. And honestly, that's been like a pretty recent realization for us. Um, turns out what matters most to them actually matters to us. It's something we can do. They really care about precision. It has to be fast because they only have 50 minutes in every class period in order to be able to get something done. They care that the students can take it from their home to, uh, to school. Um, so that's where we, the quest for the highest precision per dollar is the thing that I just keep repeating over and over and over. Um, and it took a long time for us to realize that this is what we were doing, but it's so important. And you can get, you can get to the point where you're delivering a great product to someone so much faster if you think about this in the beginning. Uh, and the other thing is, can you support the user? Yes, these people already know CAD. I'm sure like the majority of the people in this room are using Eagle or Altium or KiCad or whatever, and, uh, and they, need, they need a lot. They are designing all the time. Um, so it's great for us because we can't really teach people how to design electronics, but they already know how, so it's great. Um, and it's a good fit. So the next thing is, this is, this is, these are the ideal customers for us, people who are building their own electronics. They already know what they want. Um, they're integrating with other platforms like Arduino. Uh, and they, you know, when they come to us, they already have like huge folders like full of all the stuff that they, they want to cut. So it's kind of, well, it's a good fit. And now it feels obvious, actually. Um, the next thing is like, is the market big enough? I use the most basic math to, to run this business, which is like, okay, there's about half a million engineering students enrolled right now, and 12% of them do electrical engineering. So that's about 60,000 people. On average, the people who buy this machine, they spend about three grand, and so you just multiply, and you're like, all right, 180 million. There's a lot of, I mean, they pay like huge, like huge organizations a lot of money to try to figure out what the market size is. It doesn't really matter. You just like get a ballpark. Um, because it's, it's a guess anyway. So is that big enough? Well, I don't know. Well, it depends on how much it costs to run your company in the first two years and how much you think you can earn in the first three years, because the first year, you're not going to make any money. Um, this is a simple calculation in the Bay Area. On average, it costs me about $150,000 to employ someone and pay for all of their benefits, do about 25% of all your expenses in R&D. And so you figure, like, OK, 10 people. There's 10 people times two years times this cost. It's basically going to cost you about $4 million to run a 10-person company for two years. And if that's what you need, then you need to know, OK, that's how much I need. Can this market support it? I think that you know, we're kind of in the Silicon Valley where nobody really talks about being able to pay your bills. Um, but it's really important. <laughs> Uh, to be cash neutral if you're a hardware company because there's not a lot of investors who care about what you're doing. And um, I actually think that in the long run, we're going to be way more solid uh, because instead of the economy affecting us like this, we're kind of going to be like this. Um, so a good estimate, like a rule of thumb, is you're going to make no money the first year. You'll capture about 1% of the market your first year of sales and 3% next. And so does your earn exceed your burn. Yes, OK, $180 million is a great size of a market to go after when you need 10 people at your company. But if your market isn't $20 million, you can always bootstrap. Um, hardware costs more to do. Um, but the idea is like, all right, if you have a $20 million market, how much can you really afford to spend each year? You probably shouldn't be spending more than 200 k Just don't, don't get in over your head. Um, 
spending a lot of money on a market that's like kind of small. Um, but I actually think this is the future. I think there's a lot more that we can do with smaller scale manufacturing, very rapid. You're addressing a very specific group of people that you understand really well. And $20 million market is amazing for you. Like, I would love to just be one person supporting a market that was that big. Um, and that's actually a viable option that not a lot of people talk about. Uh, so if you decide that you do want to build something for someone, uh, then there's all the physical stuff. So what kind of manufacturing should you go after? Should you be working with the, you know, the, the people in the, um, down the peninsula? These are some of the parts that we make. So there's, there's motors, there's machined aluminum parts, there's, uh, there's plastic for the frame. And how you make something is really governed by how many of them do you want and how much money do you have to pay. Uh, and it depends on which of the two of these you choose. So you can choose flexibility and speed, but it's gonna cost you a lot and the quality is probably gonna be low. So the things that we chose were flexibility because we don't know anything, kind of. Well, we didn't, we know a lot now. Um, but we needed to have a manufacturing process that would support the fact that we were gonna learn a ton in the first couple of years. Uh, and then we chose quality because our people uh, the people using this machine really, they really care about the output. And if you, you can't, you, you just can't have them mill a crappy board. Um, so we sacrifice speed. Our manufacturing process is pretty slow. Uh, and it costs quite a bit. Um, someday maybe it'll cost less, but for now we were willing to take those, uh, take those trade-offs. So here's the other rule of thumb. And so I've done a bunch of research on how other companies are doing manufacturing and what do they use and what's the method. So year three production is really like year four of your existence. 5% of 60,000 engineers is about 3,000 units only. So we fall into the hybrid in-house final assembly, nearby outsourced parts. So you don't need that many, so you can work with people who are close, not really caring all that much about the cost of the components yet. So being able to communicate really well with your suppliers is kind of the most important thing. You need that flexibility. Um, but once you're doing 10,000 or more, you kind of, the world is your oyster. People will pay attention to you. Those, those quantities really, um, they kind of unlock different manufacturing methods uh, for you as well. And so depending on your particular thing you want to build for someone uh, during the course of the year, you can put yourself in one of these buckets. Like if you're like, this is a wearable, it's going to be huge. You need to probably raise some money and get a good partner that's going to do um, fully outsourced, like Asian manufacturing, most likely. This is our very sophisticated manufacturing line. <laughs> it's an old pipe organ factory, uh, in fact, in the mission. And this is totally appropriate for what we need. Uh, we can build about 3,000 a year there if we want, uh, if we need to. and. Um, and we can manufacture them with, you know, with a team of roughly you know, 10 to 15 people, which is awesome. So the last part is the data. The data habits were huge. So we, uh, we just started co collecting data and didn't really know what to do with it, but we were just gonna like, put it all in spreadsheets and figure out how to use it to scale eventually. And turned out this was a really smart move. So knowing how many you can build, how long it takes, how much does each part cost, when do you need to place orders, those are kind of basic. The product history part is really important though because you're never going to have enough time before you kick this product out into the world to know if it's going to break or to know exactly what's going to happen. Like we could definitely take an entire year working through, doing testing, all that, but that's not really how the world wants you to operate at this, at this point in time. And so we had to put a product out there in the world that was basically untested uh, and pretty complicated. And so knowing ev the history, basically the story of every other mill we put out there in the world made it a lot easier to diagnose problems. You know, we would get support requests and we're like, you know, all descend upon the person who has the support problem and we're like fixing, like figuring out is it a hardware problem and then we can go into our list of where did this other mill come from? 
who were all of the suppliers for every component, who did the assembly, what was the method, this was the version of the assembly instructions that we were using at the time to build it. And what that allowed us to do was then categorize, okay, from machine 50 to the machine 75, this was a thing that we did, and so now we can fix that. Without that product history, we'd basically be sunk, because then anytime someone comes through support, you're like, oh, that's a problem, we'll fix that problem. And then you don't realize like, oh, that's a thing that we should actually fix. We can incorporate that. Now that we have a very flexible manufacturing method, we can take all the things that we learned from the people who are kind of our guinea pigs. Thank you, Kickstarter backers, always. Um, and then we can fix the machine further down the line. We even have, you know, even in the production machine that we sell right now, there's, there's different <laughs> versions. You know, machine zero to machine 175 has, about, has a single pulley. Machine 176 on has like double stack pulleys because we realized this is a thing that, that we should have done the first time, we didn't have enough time, but we can fix it and take care of everybody else who has the, old, the older style machine. That's only possible because we could actually track every single part, where it came from, how much we paid for it, and who assembled it with what instructions. It's really huge. Um, and also support tracking, like knowing what is the breakdown of, of the, support that you, the support requests that you're getting, and so you can scale support appropriately. Um, that's super, super important. Um, so we built a web tool. I love to show this web tool. We hired someone to build the web tool that would track all this data. So um, there's nothing really out there that existed in, that did exactly what we wanted. So, this is the other mill. Other mill with packaging is the top line. This is all of the 227 parts that go into the other mill, all the sub-assemblies. You can click into each one and know exactly how many you have of each thing. This is our bagged accessory kit. So having a big database with a visualization allows us to look and say, okay, on this specific date, projected out into the future or in the past, this is how much inventory we had, how many of these accessory kits we can make, and then if you click into each of those components, you can see where it came from and how much you paid for it. Um, this is kind of like, would be like a team of two at least, keeping track of all this data, but we built a web tool uh, to do it instead, and this is really important. Uh, the way that people interact with it is also pretty fun. So there's so many apps out there. Like we can build apps to run our companies and they can be simple and tailored to the things that you want to know about your business. So assembled, you scrapped X quantity of such and such part, you can log that assembly, tells you what your, like, your purchasing schedule is, it calculates these things for you so you don't have to hire a bunch of people to manage the operations of your factory at a certain point in time. And it wasn't obvious that we needed to invest in something like this, but the returns have been so huge that now I tell everybody about it. This is a thing that you should do. Uh, it is really important, and it seems like it's gonna slow you down, but it's really important to do. Um, so, in summary, the things that you should think about if you're thinking about starting a hardware company or even running a project is, is who are you really building it for? Can you support them? How many of those people are there? Is the thing that you're building gonna need a lot of people? Well, then the market needs to be about 20X what you're gonna need to, to earn in the first couple of years. And then manufacturing. Knowing how many of this thing you're gonna need in year three, that's how you should scale your manufacturing from day one. And then the third part is keep track of all that data. You'll do something useful with it um, eventually and it will help you uh, and there's there's so much value in being able to look back in history when everything was like kind of chaotic and moving really quickly uh, and then and scale your business just, just through using the data about what you did back then. So if you want to come talk with me about any of these things, if you want to find out, of course, more about the other mill, uh, and if you want me to give you one of these little boards that I made yesterday instead of working on my talk, um, come find me. I will be doing Q&A, I guess, and yeah, I appreciate your time. Okay, so uh, Danielle's gonna uh, get the mic taken off, but we're gonna do uh, Q and A inside today because it's kind of.
freezing outside. Uh, so just over by the Tindy sign, behind the whiteboard, if you want to talk to her, she brought those boards as well. 